And good evening. I'm Jonathan Higgins. And I'm Larry Roof from Greensburg, and, Indiana. And we are Train Aficionado tonight, and we're talking about your new book. Is that right? That's correct. I, uh, in my semi-retirement, I'm a semi-retired veterinarian, and combination of COVID and having a few more uh, hours on hand, I uh, decided to research uh, the history of the trains here in the county I live in, Decatur County, Indiana, which is the county seat is Greensburg. So were you always a rail buff or is this something new to you? Well, it's pretty, in a way it's new and in a way it's old, Jonathan. And uh, so I grew up in Franklin, Indiana, which is south of Indianapolis. And I think this is uh, really appropriate to kind of how I got into this, this deep rabbit hole of uh, doing this book. But when I was a boy, I lived on a farm south of Franklin. And on our road, about two and a half mile west of us, a train crossed that road. Now, it, this was 1960. I'm about six or seven years old. And I can vaguely remember a train running on that that track, okay? Very shortly after that, that train was abandoned. The tracks were taken out. And over the next 10 years, I would, I would drive through that cut in the road as part of my routine life as a high school kid. And, and I knew they were, a train had once run by there. And, you know, today, as you know, 50 years later, most people that live in that area, they don't even know there was a train there at one time because everything's gone. Well, fast forward about 20 years later, when we moved to Greensburg, I moved here to Cater County. I'm a veterinarian. I'm, I'm making farm visits all over the county. And again, it's 1979. And it's obvious to me, I'm seeing remnants of rail all over our county and kind of starting to sort out that, well, gosh, there had to be train tracks go by here even though the tracks weren't there any longer. In fact, at that time, kind of the way you would know is there would be tracks still embedded in the road, but the tracks on each side were gone. And so just over the years, I, I noticed that, you know, and thought, wow, Greensburg and Decatur County had a lot of trains crisscrossing here. And it's kind of sad. They're, they're all gone, but one. And so with all that in mind, I decided, I've always been a history fan, always been a history fan. And I thought, you know, what better thing to do than uh, to try to learn about the history of the railroad in our county and put this together for kind of posterity so people would know that at one time there were a lot of trains running through this county. And that just led to a deep, deep rabbit hole that I almost didn't get out of, you know, putting this all together. So with that being said, so you started to discover these, you know, the tracks and so on, and you started to get thinking about this. So when did you really like start digging for photos and, and searching maps and really like yeah. trying to piece everything all together? So I started in 2019, about, about the middle of the year. Then COVID comes along, of course, 2020. And I, I feel like I got two years of work in one year because as we all had so much free time and yeah. thank God for the internet, you know, because you could look things up, you could see things. And uh, so anyhow, 2020, then <clears throat> 2021, uh, I was fortunate. I had a local publisher here that, that he and his wife do editing and do books. Tracy and Phyllis Winters, they do great work. And uh, they walked me through how to get this done. Phyllis edited my manuscript. Uh, Tracy placed all the photos that I would bring to him and say, this is kind of where I think this one ought to fit. And uh, so by, um, let's see, September of 2021, we were ready to send it to the publisher. And again, due to COVID, publishing was slowed down a lot. So we didn't get our books till March of 2022. So, uh, so that was kind of the process. And it was a labor of love. And uh, we just had a great time doing it. I learned. And, and more importantly, and particularly for our, our uh, locals here, it's a train book, but it tells so much about our county 
and particularly the fact that how most people don't realize the trains created everything in our county. All the little towns, all the little places didn't exist till the train went through. Then those towns existed. Yeah, I mean, the trains basically essentially created hubs, you know, where, yeah. where people could get jobs, they could, they could travel from one place to another because the train was actually there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, know, you know, in our county, big agricultural county, now you could ship all the grain out, predominantly corn and wheat at that time, but more importantly, uh, ship pigs out as well. <laughs> and, and particularly to Cincinnati, you know, most people kind of, well, not most, but a lot of people don't realize that, you know, Cincinnati, one of its nicknames was Porkopolis because it was, <laughs> it was the leading pig butcher in the United States wow. prior to Chicago taking that over. And actually in my book, I talk about that quite a bit because it's, it's pretty fascinating. The other, the other big things that the rail did was, besides agriculture, was quarrying. And I have a whole chapter in my book on that because we had lots of limestone in this county. And uh, we did not have coal, but that would have been the third thing, you know, that the rails really did, you know, was it allowed all that to get away, to, to leave, you know, otherwise it was worthless. Wow. I mean, it's certainly, you know, amazing to think of, like you said, many places have abandoned railroads and people may or may not know that it cut through the neighborhood or yeah. cut through the back of their property. Mm -hmm. um, while you were doing research and kind of talking to people, did they know that there was a railroad that went through there or some, some did, you know, you would run into some people that some did. Uh, the fun part uh, was, was pinpointing locations and when, when the rails were put in and more importantly, when they were taken out, because it's interesting, the majority, you know, we had a total, uh, as we'll see in some slides here in a minute, uh, we had a total of five lines that counting the interurban that entered the county and only one of those exists anymore. But a lot of those were abandoned in the late 60s, early 70s. So there are people around that have memories of riding the trains, okay? But sometimes their memories aren't quite as good as the facts, you know, where they might have thought they rode on this train at this time. And it's like, no, you didn't because it didn't exist after wow. such and such. So, so that was, the, as a friend of mine said to me, he said, you know, Larry, you're going to kill a lot of people's stories because you know, the memories and the facts just don't always jive, you know? So yeah. that was fun. And, uh, you know, the, the good thing, and actually I watched one of your, uh, uh, your YouTube, uh, videos on locating abandoned lines. And that's exactly how I helped pin down in our County where those were, because if you get on it, as you know, if you get on a Google map, you see these, these lines going across an area and you're like, why is there a line there? Well, that line that's now a tree line, a, a whatever, you know, it was where an abandoned railroad was, you know, that was taken out 50 years ago. And so it was that kind of thing that helped me pinpoint down where it was. Interesting over the, over the time talking to, like you said, adjacent landowners, and they would tell me that, oh yeah, they knew that it went through there. Farmers would tell me, well, it's, this is an interesting one. The original line into Decatur County, the Lawrenceburg and Indianapolis, in the eastern part of the county, the original line was built in 1853. It was abandoned in 1905, and they rebuilt that line to straighten it out, improve the grade, uh, and to double track it, and to double track it. Most people in our county had no idea where the original, that the original line even existed. They just thought, well, the line that's here today must have been that first line, but it, but it wasn't. But I talked to a couple of farmers. This was kind of fun. I talked to a couple of farmers, and they told me they, they still find spikes from that line today when they're out disking a field or whatever. They'll pop up a spike, and, and that track hasn't been there for 115 years. Wow. I mean, so that's just very cool. It's just amazing how the, you know, eventually the, the history, you know, eventually rises to the surface. Yes. I can literally. tell you that, you know, Google Maps and Google 
earth. You could spend hours on there. You find you find a spot and you're chasing it. Yeah. You know, the, the, to see where it goes. And eventually it leads to a junction of a of an active line at some point. Yes. And then you start looking at buildings. Oh, there's a roundhouse. There's yeah, that looks yeah. like an old train depot. You know, you start looking at the buildings adjacent to where that line was. Yeah, like I said, I've been down that rabbit hole many times in an evening, and all of a sudden I'm like, gosh, I've been looking at this for three hours. You know. Let's um let's take a look at some of the photos that you shared with us. Um, I'll pop them up right on the screen right now so we can kind of take a look at it. here's your book right here. Oh, yep. You know, just real quick, I, I'll tell everybody that uh, books can be purchased at the Decatur County Historical Society here in Greensburg. Uh, as I said, this was a labor of love. My, my, uh, I wrote this and put it all together, and my wife and I bought 500 copies of the book, and we donated them to our historical society. And so they're using them as a fundraiser. And so all proceeds of the book go 100% to our local historical society. And uh, so, so if you want one, just look up Decatur County Historical Society here in Indiana, and you'll be able to secure a book. Now, I'm looking at the, the cover of the book. How were you able to get a lot of these historical photos? I mean, sometimes they're hard to come by. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you what we, we got, and I want to make sure I tell you what I didn't get, and I'm looking forward to doing someday. OK, so I started at our historical society. They I, they laughed to this day. They said I walked in and I said, do you have anything on railroads and here in the county? And they had a box of just stuff. And I took the box and started digging around. And, and I found some great photos in that box. OK, that was number one. I went to historical societies in the counties around us and kind of did the same thing found some that way. And then the fun one, I, I had most of the manuscript written or at least pretty rough, roughed up. And I'm not on Facebook, but my wife is. And I walked into my wife and I said, Hey, I said, could you put a little blurb on your Facebook that I'm, that I'm writing this book and uh, I, I'm looking for some old photos, Jonathan, within five minutes, the first photos started coming in from, people, most of who I didn't even know. Wow. And, and, and they'd say, well, you know, my grandfather worked for the railroad there in Greensburg and we had a couple of photos here and I just got lots of photos like that. And it was incredible. It uh, in fact, um, uh, almost every, every photo on this cover, uh, came from, came from Facebook. As I look at the, the one in the upper left didn't, but the others all came from things that people sent me from from Facebook contacts. Wow, I mean, just, I mean, so it was basically your research and then a lot of people in the community actually yeah. got them thinking and saying, boy, I do have a few photos. And, and right the fun here. part is we, you know, as you know, we've given some presentations here in our community to try to sell books and promote it. And, you know, I've got people that are giving me photos now, you know, where they, they go, oh, well, you know, I, I think I'll go looking. And, and, you know, we're all guilty of this. We have stuff and we don't think anybody cares. And uh, one, one lady, one lady gave me a scrapbook that had about 40 photos in it, about of which about eight of them I used in the book. Wow. And, and she told me, she said, she said, you know, Larry, we almost threw this away a few years back. Her grandfather had put that book together back in the fifties and you know, it's just so a reminder to everybody listening, don't let people throw that stuff away. You know, yeah. I mean, you may actually have the only, only photos left of of a particular landmark if other people have thrown away other copies of it. That's right. The one thing that I did not get done that I that's on my to do list. OK, and I'll I'll get close in describing this. I don't have the, <clears throat> the exact title of this. And you may know. But in about 1915, the U.S. government did a inventory of all the railroads in the United States. It was for tax purposes uh, to help enable the government to tax the property that the railroads owned. And, and basically what they did, what they did was they 
they would go to a town, say a county seat like Greensburg or a small town like Alert, which is up in the upper right hand corner here. And they would they would draw a blueprint of all the railroad yard and the depot and all that stuff. And they would uh, document all this. They also took some photos. Now, I have seen photos of this, but none from my county. OK. And so my plan during this was to go out to Maryland where they're uh, kept in the National Archives. But COVID kept me from doing that. So on my to do list is to go get to look at the box that would have been done on Decatur County. And I have contacted a lady out there and and she knew exactly, of course, what I was talking about, because that's her expertise. And so it's my hope that I'm going to open this box up and find some photos that, to be honest, maybe nobody's ever seen. Wow. Yeah. So so that's that's on the to do list. But that's how we found these. And people just were kind enough to say, hey, I got something here you might want to look at. And uh, so in the book, we have about 170 photos, illustrations, maps, timetables, just a, a sprinkling of things to give our readers a feel for what was going on. You know, it's for our people in our county that live here, it's fun to see a 1916 timetable, uh, you know, of the Michigan division of, of the, the big four and to see what times and it stopped as the, all the different little towns in the county, you know, just really fun, fun reading, you know, for people. Yeah, I mean, it certainly sounds like a, a book that not only a rail fan or a train enthusiast or a history buff would enjoy, you know, some of the locals just being able to uh, look at, oh, my word, I didn't realize a, a railroad went through town. And they start looking at yeah. their town a little differently. You know, oh, they, absolutely. they say, I think it was right here. And then, oh, I I see it. <laughs> you know, yeah, the and, and one of the things we did in the book that was really fun I took some current, I, I think maybe I've got some of those in the pictures a little bit later, but I took some current photos, put them side by side with some pictures that the picture might be 100 years old. And to show people, if you'd have been here in 1906, it would have looked like this. But when you drive by today, it doesn't look anything like that. And I've had so many people come up to me in town and say, man, we never drive by that without looking at it different now, you know? So, so really fun, really fun. Wow. All right. Let me... and, and, and the other thing, Jonathan, that I point yeah. out to people, this all was going on in your hometown as well. You know, if you, you live in Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, you know, you have trains and then train lines that were abandoned. And there's a story to tell there for your community and uh, really fun. Yeah, I know. I know there's so many abandonments in the Northeast being from uh, New England. Um, there was a lot of lines that were actually redundant of each other because there was competitors, you know, like you would have one railroad, you know, uh, making a route from Boston to New York. And then you would have another railroad and they're competing with one another. And eventually, as you know, in history, all these railroads eventually get consolidated and they're trying to figure out, OK, do we keep this north south line? Or this one. We've got yeah. two of them, but, and they yeah. basically go to the same spots, but different communities along the route. Yeah, it was really fun writing the book and reading. And, and in the back of the book, I have a number of, you know, I not only looked at a lot of newspaper articles from a local standpoint, but I, you know, I read a number of railroad books that were really excellent resources on what I would kind of call the big picture, you know, understanding the big four, the New York Central, which really helped me as I, I wrote the book. And, and it's fascinating, like you said, from, from the really start in 1840s up until 1890s, you know, everybody was competing, building competing lines, doing, and then eventually they had to say, hey, this, this cost us too much money. We can't afford to run these. And so that, you know, that's really when it all started. And then gradually a bit more abandonments, more abandonments. So so, yeah, very fascinating. And, and I, one of the things I try to do in the book in the first couple of chapters is help people understand that a little bit about this 
this mania that was going on as an example in the state of Indiana to build railroads and all the, the fast starts and then stops and things that went on. Because one of the consistent things as you read through the book is there was a financial panic about every 20 years in this country in the 1800s. And it just would obliterate rail, you know, rail companies, create consolidations, things like that. I have a, I actually have a whole chapter in the book on what I call the rail lines that never were. And in our county, there were about nine lines voted on by the taxpayers and proposed lines through the county that never got built because of the panic of 1873. And so it was really fun. Uh, it, for, for me, probably not so much for the reader, but for me, that chapter on all the ones that didn't get built that I found all the data on, that was a really rewarding chapter, you know, because there'd be all these articles in the local newspapers. We're voting on the Evansville and Richmond Railroad. We're voting on the, the Toledo and something railroad. And then it never happened. It just, it never got off the ground, you know? Jeez, that's so crazy. You know, to think of that, you know, those are the, those are the lines that are hard to find because they didn't exist in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they were, they were a legal entity. They were voted on by the local taxpayers and then nothing, nothing happened. And uh, so, yeah, that was uh, pr pretty interesting, but, but such a game changer. I, I point out in the book that when the first line in our County, well, uh, before I get to, I'll get to that here in a second. But anyhow, these are five these are five depots that were in our county out uh, in the little towns in the county. And the one in the upper right hand corner at Alert is the actual only one that still survives. A guy has that in his backyard, and he's kind of doing some stuff to try to restore it a little bit. And uh, so that's pretty cool. But the others are all all destroyed, and uh, so this is our memory of them. This is wow, I mean, that's so sad, you know, because, I mean, at least if these landmarks stood in place, you know, the, you know, that would be awesome. But at least one survived. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. Uh, the guy that owns that, I spent some time there and it was really cool to see the uh, pegs where the telegraph wires came into the, the depot. Wow. Yeah, that's that's pretty fun. I mean, I stand there looking at that and thinking, wow, those are those are telegraph wires. Those aren't electric wire. Uh, pegs, you know, pretty fun. All right. Uh, let me yeah, show us the next, uh, the next one. So, so this, this is the county here, the county yeah. map, right? This is our county, Decatur County, and Greensburg is right there in the center. And this red line indicates the first line that went through in 1853. It actually ran from Lawrenceburg, Indiana, to Indianapolis. It was completed in November of 1853. The uh, the connection with Cincinnati uh, didn't come for a few more years after that. And I won't bore people with all the details, but it's in the book. But initially, the, the line did not go to Cincinnati. And uh, so they, they it reached Greensburg in May of 1853 and then got all the way to Indianapolis. And when that happened, you could go from Indianapolis to Lawrenceburg uh, in, in six hours and that had previously taken about seven days passenger, uh, 10 to 12 days freight. So wow. just incredible. I, I don't think, you know, we all, we've all lived through the internet and cell phones, but nothing compares with that. I mean, yeah. that's just such a game changer uh, for people to be able to travel all of a sudden. Yeah, I mean, when you're talking days and then it's reduced down to hours, uh, that's yeah, just yeah. amazing. It's, it's, it's just far hard for us to wrap our, our head around that. So this was our first line. And interestingly enough, uh, this line still exists. It is owned from Indianapolis to Shelbyville, Indiana, which is the county uh, seat on northwest of us. And then uh, G&W owns the line from from basically the state line up to uh shelbyville now the the honda plant in greensburg is uh, just west of of greensburg and the line today is actually uh i forget the exact word but just closed we'll, we'll use that from the town of adams 
to Shelbyville. Um, there's talk that someday those we may see trains go all the way through again, but we'll. I, I speculate that on my uh, in my book at the end. So well, that would be good. You know, I've seen some lines. You know, that are basically. Um you know, shut down and they become active again because there's a demand. There's customers yep. that want to use the railroad, you know, to ship goods or even passenger service. I was told in, in and I didn't put this in the book, but in, in some of my research, this, the line from the state line, Ohio, Indiana state line to Indianapolis, they would need to replace a bridge at St. Paul, which is up in the very upper left corner here of the county. And, uh, and a guy told me that, to redo all the track would be about two hundred thousand dollars a mile. So I, I, I found that on the one hand that doesn't sound that expensive. On the other hand, it's a lot of money, you know. Yeah. You but think. but but I do know there are conversations around that on this line. And that is a you know, I mean, and it all takes a little bit of money in order to make this work. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So this was the first line in the county. Go ahead to the next slide. And, mm. and, and I put this aerial shot in here because, as we mentioned earlier, if you, if you look kind of in the center, you'll see uh, a straight line, which is the current, the current line. But that line wasn't put in until 1905. That's when they changed the grade, double-tracked it, and straightened it. The original line, if you look, <clears throat> there's a lake on the right-hand side, and you see it kind of make an S curve up across, and then there's kind of a straight line. That was the original line in 1853. Wow. And, and uh, what for, for the locals here, that Lake McCoy was, of course, not there in 1853. And what everybody thinks of as the dam at Lake McCoy was actually the rail bed of the original track through there. If you would... Prior to my book, if you would have asked anybody in Decatur County, what's that down there at Lake McCoy? They'd say, well, that's the dam at Lake McCoy. But my book straightens out to everybody that, no, that was the rail bed. There was no lake there. And it was only after that line was abandoned that a guy bought the, the area and made the lake and utilizing the rail bed as his dam. <laughs> Very creative thinking there because, you know, that rail bed is raised up. So it will. Yeah, it, it was 35 foot tall. It was 35 foot tall. And uh, but that was one of the fun things to straighten out uh, for all our local people here that no, late, they didn't build a dam at Lake McCoy. They just took advantage of the existing rail bed. Wow. And, and the other thing I'd point out, because I know a lot of people like. You know, I, I've said with my book that I want people to drive around and have the book in the front seat of the car and go, oh, that that's what Larry's talking about. And it's and it's really fascinating, Jonathan, if you park on the little road in front of the dam at Lake McCoy and then look south to the existing dam, you immediately realize the grade difference. It's like, oh, my gosh, look what they did when they straightened this and changed the grade. You know, it just it just becomes clear what the purpose was. Yeah. I'm sure it wasn't cost effective having that grade, you know, I mean, you think of, you think of, you know, um, you know, they were concerned about fuel and such back then as well. You know, I mean, uh, a line is, uh, you know, like a, a nice line that's flat it is very profitable because you're not using as much coal or whatever it may yeah. be or diesel you know, to go across that, that, that land where you're constantly in an uphill and you're towing all that weight, you're constantly using fuel. Yeah. And that, that line to get out of Decatur County for a second, the line from Rushville up to, to Sunman, Indiana, that, that was climbing about 40 stories high, about 400 feet. And the articles I read told how they used to use, uh, helper helper engines to push those trains up up that grade i can't imagine you know that's yeah. that's a, a grade that you know that was that's huge wow yeah, yeah and and uh we've had a couple of times where the group out of lebanon ohio has run they run a passenger train from basically cincinnati up to greensburg and back kind of a day trip 
They did one last year, I think in May. And uh, anyhow, it's fun to ride that. And, and as you're coming up out of Lawrenceburg, you're like, no wonder, you know, this was, this was uphill, you know, that's for sure. Not bad going down it though, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I always, I make the comment, our house is actually just a little bit east of town and we're about a half mile from the track. And when the Honda train goes towards Cincinnati, I always say, well, he just coasts all the way to Cincinnati. You know, he, he just coasts all the way. Wow. So next, next slide, please. Oh, this is cool. Yeah, so this is this is a uh, this is right on the edge of Greensburg. This was the original track coming in to the town that was built in 1853, and this little creek is called Sand Creek. And uh, today, uh, in, in the book, I show this, but today you can go and stand right there, and the abutments are still there. You know, when they when they took the track out in 1905. To, to build the other one. Of course, they left the abutments there and you can just, you can go sit on the abutments just like these people are sitting on the abutments. And uh, another funny one, I've had people tell me, oh yeah, I've sat on those abutments. You know, I've gone up there and, and looked at them and, and, you know, people drive by these every day and now they know that they were built in 1853. Wow. I mean, yeah, I've seen I've seen some of these. Uh, there was an abandoned railroad line in North Attleboro, Massachusetts. And if it wasn't for the the abutments um, that, you know, you would go through on a, on the road, basically the the line was elevated. Mm -hmm. You know, you wouldn't even know that a railroad line went through there. But those abutments are definitely a dead giveaway. Yeah. yeah. And we have a number of those in the county that I that I put in the book for people, again, to get on their road trip. And yep. drive around and go. Oh, there they are. There, there they are. That is super cool. And and this is kind of a fun example of being able to trace something down. We know that this line quit in 1905 because they replaced it with the new one. We don't know the date of of this photo, but we know that it's pre 1905 just because of the facts of the the track itself. Wow. Very fun photo. Got this one from the Historical Society. Somebody had uh, had put it in that box. I have no idea. Next, next slide, please. So New York so, Central. Yeah. So Greensburg was a major hub for almost 90 years. And the reason was that first track that we just showed, that eventually became the Big Four in 1890 which then was actually kind of a subsidiary of the New York Central. And they started calling it officially the New York Central in about 1929. Uh, and so this photo was taken in the 1950s. And uh, just a great picture, great picture. And it shows two things. Uh, one, the, the coal tower that was sometimes called a tipple uh, for us, for us farmer type people, we think of it as an elevator because that's really what it is. And Greensburg actually had three of these. And this was the third one. And it was about seven or eight stories high. And in the book, I, I tell a lot of the details about these three coal uh, structures that were built there over the years. And I, I, saw, I don't want to bore people with numbers tonight, but I cite numbers in the book like as an example in in uh, when the second one was built in 1906 they were using 400 ton of coal a day wow. just just to fill the engines up that were going through greensburg that that wasn't coal they were selling locally you know that was just coal to fill up the various engines that were passing through town every day. The the quantities, Jonathan, are just crazy sometimes. Yeah, I mean, just to operate the railroad, you know, that's... Yeah, yeah, just just to operate the railroad. And again, because Greensburg was a, a, a hub, then that was a great place for refueling. Yeah, I mean, the, you usually would see that, you know, the, you know, uh, uh, you know refueling, crew changes, and... And all of that, you know, yeah, it's just fantastic. 
and this is this is a great great photo. The second structure that's kind of interesting is the little two story structure, the interlocking tower. Mm -hmm. And uh, gosh, I met, I got to give a shout out to him. I met a guy from Fort Wayne named Wally Mattis, M A T T E S. Man, he is one of the experts on these towers. Wally knows more about these things than you ought to be allowed to know. And uh, of course, for for a novice like me, the original tower for Greensburg was built a little farther east of this one in 1899. And, and I found courtesy of Wally, a great article in a railroad magazine from 1899 that showed photos of Greensburg's tower, the brand new tower that was being built by the big four and how it operated. And of course, at that time, these all operated mechanically with levers that were controlled from the tower that connected to all the switches out in the line. Over time, of course, all that got electrified rather than mechanical. Fascinating story. And Wally was, man, he was incredible help uh, putting that information together. And that was one of the fun things. And and look, you, you know, they say a book is never done, and I believe it. Uh, I would just bump into people in my research. And number one, they were so full of knowledge. And number two, they were always so willing to share their information, what they had. Yeah, I mean that's the greatest thing. You may you you're picking up parts and pieces of the history from the various people that you meet, and it's just you know, it's just like you just want to jot it all down or yeah. take it yeah. as much as you can. Yeah. So anyhow, I love this. I love this photo, and uh, it's amazing to think of this photo was taken in in 1950. To to think of you know that wasn't that far. Right. Off. Right. You know. No. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, now, of course, I've walked this yard and, you know, photos like this really allow you to use your imagination. As an example, the, the ramp that the coal cars actually, the, the cars actually went up a ramp and then unloaded in the tipple there. And part of that ramp structure is still there today, you know, uh, all these years later, even though most everything else around there, you you can't find any hardly any memory of that. Wow. So yeah, great, great photo. I great, love that. Great photo. Next slide, please. So Adams, a little town northwest of Greensburg. And here was their here was their depot. And fun to find this photo, you know. And uh don't know the date, but assume it early 1900s. Uh, and uh just really fun to to go out to Adams and and uh, again because this track still is there. Uh, Adams was named for our first or our second president. You know that's that's kind of the time frame. And 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 Adams is a good example. When the train first went through in 1853, Jonathan, there was no Adams. And then as within about eight months, they platted a town there because there was a railroad. There was a reason to have a town. And, and in our county, that was typical of about nine little small communities. And in any town in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, it would have been the same way. You know, the railroad decided to stop somewhere. They, they made a stop. And then pretty soon, the, the local people platted a town there. Exactly. You know, the railroad <laughs> came, they decided to stop there. There you go. Everything was built around that that depot, essentially. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, we have two examples. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, I'll, I'll show those in another slide. I'll talk about those where they weren't there and they moved them. You know, they they quickly said this our, where, where we had our town was a bad place. Let's move a little closer. So, <laughs> next slide. Yeah. So oh, well, this is one of my favorite photos. Because anybody that looks at this photo just goes, well, this is interesting. What What's going on here? So this is a photo taken uh, about 1900 and uh, maybe a little before. We're not 100% sure. But this is at St. Paul, Indiana, which is started in Decatur County. And as it grew, it actually grew into Shelby County. That grain elevator that you see in the photo is actually in the next county. Okay, that's which is kind of, but St. Paul was actually in Decatur County. 
And the, in the photo, you see the thing where it's a telegraph office, which I just think is so cool to see that. And, and then the, the, the $64,000 question is, what's going on in this photo? We see three ladies all dressed up. We see a, a gentleman all dressed up. And so, you know, the questions are, and thoughts are, well, they're saying goodbye or they're saying hello. But the truth of the matter is the guy is the station master. He is the station master. And he was there to greet anybody arriving or departing at uh, the depot. And that's how dressed up he was. Isn't that fascinating? Wow. I mean, I, you know, I thought, you know, like a lot of things are going through my mind. You look like a couple that just got married. You I know? know, I know, I know. And, <laughs> uh, and, and thank goodness for the people. There's a, there's a great, uh, and, and again, road trip. I'm a big believer in road trips, Jonathan. Okay. So at St. Paul today, on Friday and Saturday afternoons, the St. Paul Museum is open. There's a little museum there. And they had some great photos that I used in my book. And the lady's name is Gladys Pike. And she is a wealth of information. And uh, the fun part was in our research and stuff, we found some things that Gladys didn't know about the St. Paul area. So that was fun too. And, uh, and there's a great the St. Paul Tavern, in fact, I'll hold my glass up here, give them an advertisement. The St. Paul Tavern is yeah. a great place to get a sandwich and a beer, and you can go to the museum. And even though the railroad tracks are still there, the train does not go through there currently, but you can go uh, go see St. Paul. So I'd recommend that highly. Wow, that's such a cool photo. No, it's just a great photo. Just a great photo. Next slide. Well, so Ooh, yeah, so yeah, too good. <laughs> so, so a little history of St. Paul. We we just saw the first depot. Mm -hmm. The first depot was actually an arson, uh, burnt the first depot to the ground, wow. and that that's a whole interesting story about St. Paul that I'll save for another night. They built a second depot, and in January twentieth of uh, the, so they built it about 1905, 1910, something like that. January 20th, 1942, you're just a month after Pearl Harbor. This is what happened in St. Paul. And, and the depot uh, station master went to supper, went to supper, fortunately, because 20 minutes later, a train went through and derailed in the middle of St. Paul. And this is the photo you see uh, taken from the grain elevator. Uh, looking down on it, and you can see the depot that's been shoved off to the right, uh, oh. and 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 the station master would have been in that depot had he not gone home to supper. So that's very a good thing that he that he left. Yeah, and isn't this a great picture? Wow, well, what a what an incident. Yeah, and uh, and in fact, they because it was so close after. Uh, Pearl Harbor, the FBI came and investigated this accident because they wondered if it was sabotage. And of course, it turned out it, it wasn't. But uh, but yeah, and you can, you know, if you go if you go to the St. Paul Tavern, you'd be standing just kind of on the left side of the photo today. And interesting enough, nobody was hurt. Nobody was hurt. Tore the depot up. But uh, great photograph and courtesy of the museum there. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, a lot of fun. Well, this, the second railroad that was built in our county was called the Vernon Greensburg Rushville Railroad. And uh, it ran from Rushville, Indiana and Rush County down to Vernon, Indiana, which is Jennings County, the county south of us. And uh, for, for locals, it's interesting because most people realize that Vernon is the county seat of Jennings County, but the big town in Jennings County is called North Vernon. And the reason North Vernon became a much bigger town is because it became a major rail center as well. And uh, so you can you can go to North Vernon sometime and and see that that history. But this is the second uh, the second track that was built in the county, and then eventually this track was taken over by the Big Four uh, because it, this was only about a forty five mile thing. And then they this eventually became the Michigan Division of the big four. 
running from Benton Harbor, Michigan to Louisville. And so because that one crisscrossed here in Greensburg, the Michigan division, and then the line we showed initially, that became the Chicago division of the big four running from Chicago to Florida. And the fact that those two lines crossed here and then went to Louisville, that was part of what made Greensburg a major, major hub. Yeah, especially for passenger service and yeah. freight having that. Um, when it crossed, was it like a railroad diamond or was it an over under or? It was a, uh, it was all on one level and the, the, the line coming into town on this actually did a, a, and I described this a lot better in the book, but it was a Y. And so it wide into the existing main line. And then they, they shared track for about a mile. And then it split off, as you can see, and went south southwest out of town. Wow. That must have been, you know, in its heyday with them sharing a piece of track. Must have been quite a busy stretch oh, of track. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and in one of the one of the illustrations that I ran across, there were about I, th I think it, I have to look, I should look at my book, but it, there were about 15 miles of track in the, in the yard at Greensburg at one time at its peak, wow. which is just incredible to think about that. And the other thing I ran across was, you know, there were, there were local trains as well as express trains. And uh, so the, the, the big four uh, had train, had trains running from Chicago to, to Cincinnati uh, six passenger trains each direction every day. And I think it's hard for people to understand that those trains, so so Greensburg would typically have about, now they wouldn't stop, but they would have about 10,000 people a day passing through Greensburg. It's amazing is, to think which, of that. Yeah, And the other thing, Jonathan, those trains were going 60, 65 mile an hour, which I think that's hard for us to imagine 100 years ago. Yeah, at that time, you know, being able to move, um, you know, I mean, there's still like uh, just looking at, uh, you know, the MBTA's commuter rail, those trains are going about that speed, you know, mm -hmm. uh, on some lines. So you think of it, you know, you know, like you said, 100 years ago, going at that speed. It's just so, so this line was completed in 1882 and then it was abandoned and all all disappeared uh, in 1970, roughly. Those dates are all in the book. I, I have some nice timelines at the back of each chapter on these different lines so people can kind of keep them straight. You would think, you know, with this being a line, you know, going through the county that this wouldn't be one of the abandoned ones. And this one is. Yeah. Yeah. Evidently. So I, so I had a couple of cool things with this. I got to talk to an engineer, 94 years old, that used to drive this line every six days a week in the 1960s and and they they went to louisville and uh, he just said the freight just kept drying up and drying up and drying up and so evidently that's what led to that yeah i totally get that if the you know because most of the lines when they when uh when the automobile came around Mm -hmm. You know, the, a lot of the lines, you know, they stopped doing passenger service. So the freight service kept the line going. Right. If they didn't have the freight service then. And then they, yeah, they, they, there just wasn't a reason to be there. So so this was actually our second one. And this this is one of the ones that it's fun to drive around the county and find the remnants of where this one where this one went. Next slide, please. This is this is a photo uh, I ran across two photos that we think were taken. We're pretty sure were taken in the 1950s, and they were both on this line. This is Sandusky, uh, up in the which it was on the VGR, the very northern part of the the county, and you can see the track going through there. There's a grain elevator, and then there's a, a school that was built in 1915 in the background, and that school is still there. Everything else in this photo is gone; doesn't, doesn't exist anymore, and. Uh, but this is a good example of, uh, you know, the fact that the railroad served as the way to get to ship grain out of these areas. Because all these little towns had elevators on them for the buying and selling of grain. Oh. Great photo. Great photo. 
Is it a? It looks like a double line track. Am I mistaken? They, actually, it was a single with a spur. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. And and then there was there was a long. And this was the fun of looking these things up. There was the main track. There was a a kind of a more of a passing track, and then there was a spur to the elevator as well. Here, I gotcha. Yeah, that's a good good observation. Good observation. So yeah, this one was never double tracked, but in you know in some of these communities there would be a spur or a siding or or a passing track maybe. Great folks. Um, I put this one in. This was on the same line. This was a, uh, a little town called Horace, uh, which literally today there might be four houses there. But this, this, this had a main line going through it, and the passing track is to the left. The passing track, I kind of forget, it's in the book, but the passing track was about a half mile long. But the importance of this photo, this appeared in a 1929 uh, railroad magazine that my friend Wally gave me. And, and the significance of this was the big four had just started controlling remotely from Greensburg the semaphore here to tell trains they could come through or not come through. And for those listeners who, and I'm sure not an expert in this, but keep in mind that before uh, remote control like this, you, you created a block between two locations. You had somebody at Greensburg, say, and somebody at maybe Westport, and you communicated via telegraph and said, okay, a train can now go north on this track. Nothing can go south. Well, in 1929, the Big Four installed these remote controls, and they were controlling these semaphores from Greensburg, and that was a huge technology change. Yeah, certainly is any time you can do something remote like that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's a fun picture. And and the cool thing for a lot of our locals, they'd never seen a photo of the train tracks through through Horace because those tracks have been gone for 50 years. Wow. And so so a lot of fun for people to see that picture. Next slide. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, this was a fun one. This was a fun one. So this track continued down from Horace to Letts to the town of Westport. We'll talk a little more about Westport in a minute. And if you look real close on there, if I get my glasses on, you can see that stamped on the side of this bridge is 1905. Yeah. So in 1904 on the VGR, which was now called the Big Four, a lady named Kate Highland, who happened to be married to an engineer, which was kind of interesting. She got up in the middle of the night to take care of her baby, to get some water for her baby. She went outside and she looked and the trestle was on fire over, over Mill Creek right here south of Westport. She grabbed her lantern. She knew there was a freight train due to come from the north. She grabbed her lantern. She ran up the tracks, flagged the freight train down, and got them to stop before they ran across the burning bridge at Mill Creek. She then went back to taking care of her baby which was kind of interesting. That's she, She'd done this great hero's job and then went back. So then they built this new bridge in 1905. And today, if you drive by there, this is the lane back to a custom meat butchering plant, small family-owned uh, meat butchering plant. And most people that see that just think it's the bridge over the creek in the driveway going back to the, the custom butcher plant. But actually, it's a, a, a bridge that was built by the Big Four in 1905. Thanks, thanks, thanks to Kate Highland's quick action, so that there wasn't a train wreck here. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, that fun was story, fun story. And for us locally, we we've really immortalized Kate Highland in our book. Yeah, that's awesome. I noticed they went from that must have been a wooden structure, the one that yeah. came out higher. Yeah. And they were a little bit, you know, you know they figured we're not going to have that happen again. <laughs> yeah. So this one's going to stand for a long time, long time. And again, this is a great one to drive by and go, wow, there's where it went. You know, there's where it was. Next slide, please. So the third track that came in was what's called the Columbus Hope Greensburg. And it ran from Columbus, Indiana, which would be to the 
to the left of us through Hope and then to Greensburg. This is an example. This track was completed in 1884. And to be honest, probably should have never been built. And there was a lot of fight about it. And it was never, the big four ended up controlling this one as well. And uh, it was it was never a profitable line. The last passenger service, again, it started in 1884. The last passenger service was uh, 1941, right before Pearl Harbor. And uh, so that was uh, very, uh, an example of, of, of overbuilding lines, you know, that just weren't in the right place. But this was our third one, and it and it connected into Greensburg. So it certainly made it a hub, that's for sure, with all the various yeah. lines. And this line is, is gone as well, right? Yeah, this one's gone as well. This one's gone as well. Next slide, please. Okay. So on that line, if you go over to Clifty Creek, which is west of the little town of Bernie, and uh, get off the road there and... There you can see the trestle, and you can't see it real well, but over to the right, the abutment is actually still there. The trees kind of cover it up. Yeah. But uh, but if, you, if you're there in person, you, you'll see these and just great memories of, of structures that were built in about 1883 and uh, are still standing there as a memory to, uh, to the railroad that once crossed Clifty Creek. Oh, I mean, it's amazing, you know, something built at that time. It was certainly built to last, as you can yes. see here. Yes, I mean, I mean, just think about the engineering skills to to do all this stuff that they did. No I mean, no computers at all. We, just... we I, I, I'll tell, I tell this story on the VGR. So the one, the second one that was the forty-five miles. At the time I was writing the book in Greensburg, we have a little, we have a kind of a main street that's called Lincoln Street. It, it runs about eight tenths of a mile. And during that time, they were doing a bunch of renovation on Lincoln Street and they ran into some problems. Anyhow, it, it, took, them, it took them 14 months to do this renovation, okay, on Lincoln Street. And when I was doing the research on my book, the VGR Railroad was built in a year and a half, 45 miles of track. And, and I just said to myself and told some friends, I said, gosh, we're so soft today. You know, those people... They knew how to get something done when they went after it. They went after it. And and by the way, paid locals when they built that, paid locals about a dollar and a quarter a day to work on the uh, the construction. It was hard labor. I mean, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So pretty cool. Pretty cool. Next slide, please. And so the fourth and final railroad that came into the county was another probably wasted effort that it was called the Evansville and Richmond, but it actually started over in Du Bois County, Indiana. And it was supposed to run to Richmond, Indiana. It was supposed to come up from Westport up to Greensburg and then go to Richmond, but they ran out of money. And uh, so it, it reached Westport and that was uh, as far as it ever got. Uh, in, in a bunch of the mergers, one of the cool things that we learned, in a bunch of the mergers, eventually this rail line was was purchased by the Milwaukee, what was called the Milwaukee. And that was actually a Western railroad. And this was the, Westport had the distinction for a very short period of time of being the easternmost point in the United States of a Western railroad. <laughs> so that was one of those little pieces of trivia that was kind of fun to find out. Wow. I mean, it's, it's amazing, you know, that, that all these lines and only... Only yeah. you know what survived that yeah. survived. Yeah. So, so I've so I've shown you four four lines that were built in our county, and only one of them survives today, and it's not a through and through today, wow. even, even even though I think it will be someday. I Next hope, slide. I Next hope slide. so. Yeah, you and me both. So this was part of the uh, the E and R down there, and this is this is a great guy right here. This is George Caraway, and. Uh, uh, George uh, is the guy that kept the alert depot that's on the cover of the book. And, and so where George is standing, he's standing by the rail bed of uh, the E&R as it passed through alert. And uh, he's standing where the depot <clears throat> would have been standing. And if you look at the cover of the book, you'll see the depot and you'll see the tracks in, in front of it. And uh, so that's why I put that picture in there. And it, 
again, you can drive down to alert and see where the rail bed was and imagine where the depot was. And then you can go a couple of houses back and you can actually see the depot that George, George kept. So my hat's off to George that he didn't let him tear that depot down. So they ended up moving it away from the yeah, road uh, from the original from the original location. So a fun fun photo, and this um, is actually looking this is looking west, and so <clears throat> the train would have left the county in about another half mile or so. So from what it sounds like, it's the building's still pretty much intact. The way yeah it was. yeah yeah it's pretty good. It's it's in pretty good shape. I mean. Uh, and uh, in the book, one of the cool things was George shared with me, and I, I have a photo in the book. He was taking some planking off, and he found a deposit book from like 1905 of the railroad, a bank deposit book. And we, we've got a nice photo in the book of this ticket, you know, like a deposit ticket. And just just fun stuff, you know, just fun. Imagine, you know, that surviving the, that yeah, many years. All, all those years, you know. And uh, so anyhow, very cool. So we're we're indebted to George for saving the Alert Depot. Yeah, I mean, that's the only one that's left. Of, of all ours in the county. So next slide, please. Oh, so here's here here's a photo of it. And so if you think about it, George is standing on the front where the front porch of the depot would have been. Okay. And uh, it's just it's just interesting to think to get in the wayback machine and go, wow, that's what it looked like. Wow, yeah, that's super awesome. Yeah, we love that. Next slide. So this is a fun one. The same line. Here's uh, I knew the train bed of the ran right through where this driveway was. I mean, I I knew that from my maps. But in Sardinia, I was having a hard time finding out where the depot was. And so I, so George, the guy we just saw, told me about a guy that lived over in Sardinia. He said, he's in his late 80s, Larry. He's probably your best shot at finding out. So I go over and he not only lives in this house, but he told me, and the photo doesn't really show up very well, but the tree to the left of the driveway, the stones around that, are all foundation stones from the depot and the depot, the depot sat right there, right, right, essentially kind of in the grassy area. And so the fun part, I was thankful to him, Jonathan, that he could tell me that. And then if you go to the next slide, I got to show him this picture because that's what it looked like in 1900. That's what his, that's what his driveway and his tree and his flower bed looked like in 1900. Wow. So that was really fun. That's really cool. I mean, if you if you flip back to that other one just a second. Sure. Oops, it's one yeah. too many. There yeah. we go. And, and you just look at that, and then you go to the next one, and you just go, wow. <laughs> yeah, to two different worlds at this point. Yeah, 100 years apart, and uh, and good that we can, we can kind of document where they were. And then again, a fun photo. Look at those children all dressed up. Yeah. yeah. It's so amazing. Yeah, a lot of fun. It's it was just you can tell I had a lot of fun doing this. My wife some nights would come down and she'd go, You know, you've been sitting there for four hours. I said, Yeah. I said, I guess. So it was really good. Yeah, it's just so much fun doing the research, kind of putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Yeah. And um uh, like I said, I read thousands of newspaper articles, local, because the local newspapers had so much about the railroads and and gave me details that, you know, I would I didn't get from just like some of the big overview books that really told like the history of the big four that real scholars have written. You know, that gave me the big overview. But the local newspapers gave me a lot of information and flavor that I couldn't have gotten anywhere else. Wow. Next slide. I think we're about done actually with these. So, so uh, another thing, one of the chapters in the books about the quarries, we mentioned the quarries earlier and actually Greensburg had four major quarries. We had a lot of quarries besides these, but these all connected with spurs to the railroad. And so 
when the first line went through in 1853, the line that you see going straight up there, just a little bit to the left of Greensburg, that was called Harris City. And they actually built a six mile spur that ran all the way up to connect to the main line due, wow. to, that, due to that quarry, a six mile spur. And uh, they really wanted to connect there. They really wanted to connect. And, and a lot of that stone out of Harris City ended up in major buildings around the United States, one of which was the Indiana State Capitol, which was pretty cool. <clears throat> New Point, which is a circle to the right, St. Paul, the circle to the upper left, and then Westport, the circle at the bottom. Those were all major quarry locations uh, that ship via rail. Ship. And, and the chapter on quarries really takes you back to that time and gives you some ideas about the quantities of stone that were pulled out of these places. Pretty crazy. And, and some great, we've, we found some great photos that people sent to us that, I mean, they almost make you cry. They're so cool. Wow. They're just so cool. Next slide. Oh, that's one of them. So a lady, a lady sent me, I think there were six photos altogether of the quarries at new point. These, these, uh, Photos were taken at the quarries at New Point, probably sometime around 1890, 1880, somewhere in that time frame. How cool are these? Yeah, that's super neat. I mean, we just can't even imagine yeah. know, what it was like. <clears throat> what it was like. So this 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 one actually connected to the main line. It was about a mile long. The spur was here. It was about a mile long to to get back to the. Uh, the main line and yet again very hard labor oh yeah yeah you know there you, you can kind of see it in the background and i i didn't put this one in the book but i she one of the photos she gave me shows kind of like the guys you see in the background of this standing there yeah and and there's like 12 guys in this photo they're all so skinny they look like they're emaciated but you're thinking no they could probably whip anybody that got in their way, you know, because they were probably so strong and uh, probably burnt calories at a level we can't imagine, you know. Sure. We, we can't imagine, you know. So very fun photo. Next slide. And then finally, the last thing we mentioned are the inner urbans. And I know a lot of your listeners are familiar with the inner urbans. And uh, Greensburg had one that came from Indianapolis that reached Greensburg. Uh, it was opened in 1907, closed in 1932. You know, the inner urbans were probably an example. The railroads had already almost given up on passenger service and the inner urbans came along and they, they thought they could revive it and it just didn't work. And so we had 25 years of inner urban service here in Decatur County. Uh -huh. and, and for some of the listeners, this fanned out from Indianapolis. So all these these lines fanned out from Indianapolis and were they weren't purely passenger. They started out that way, but eventually they realized they had to haul freight too to try to make it work. And again, they just they couldn't make it work. The automobile the automobiles just started to kill them. Just yeah. started to kill them. Jeez. Very very fun. And that that line ran just. Uh, on the north side of the existing rail bed, they purchased right away. And so it, it laid just to the side of that. And, and in most of the county, it's real easy to see that, that rail bed from the inner urban as well. Yeah. I mean, with the gas prices current at this current time, yeah. they, some people probably wish those inner urbans were there. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this was pretty fun. So before you get into St. Paul, you have to cross the Flat Rock River. Now, the train you see in the background is the existing track that was built in uh, 1853. This photo is taken in 1906. And they're building, they're building the inner urban bridge over the Flat Rock. And so you can see some construction techniques and you see the train that ran not the inner urban train, the, what would have been the big four train actually running across the, the bridge at, at, at St. Paul. That bridge still exists, but it's in a, it's been, it was updated 
a number of years later. So it doesn't look like this bridge looks or the bridge looks today. But, you know, sometimes we see something, we go, how'd they do that? Well, this is how they did it. <laughs> this is how they did it. Next slide. And here, here's the finished product. Here's an interurban car crossing that track that we saw being built in the last photo. Wow. Very cool picture. Yeah, that's certainly really awesome. And he's headed for uh, he's headed for Greensburg, the direction he'd be coming. He'd be leaving St. Paul, headed for Greensburg. And uh, uh, if you go up there today, you can see the uh, the the steel that you see is gone, but the uh, trestle, the concrete trestles, are still there in the abutments. You can still see those. Another good road trip, John. Jonathan, you got to come up and drive, drive this uh, Decatur County. Yeah, definitely. Next slide. So, just in summary, we had four lines in an interurban, uh, the 1853 to the present, and then the next ones, as you can see there, 1971, 73, uh, 61, and 32 were when they ended, and then the various quarry connections when they when they started, uh, and then over time, those quarry connections disappeared as well. So we had a rich history in this county, a rich history, and, and now it consists of one line that's still there. And in the book, in Chapter 12, I tell the story, I call it Wounded and Left for Dead, and it tells how the, the line that's still there today, had it not been for a lot of local people fighting and fighting, and fighting some more, we wouldn't have that line today. We wouldn't have that line today. Wow, I mean, that's just so amazing, you know. I mean, just the amount of rail traffic in the heyday that this county was getting, now it's just, you know, it's all... Out on, it's, it's out on the interstate on 74. You know, that's that's where most of it is. The thing that I wanted to ask you, you've been getting a lot of stuff after completing the book. Is there a possibility you're working on a second book? Well, that's a great question. I what I'm what I am doing is the photos that I'm getting, I'm digitizing and cataloging them. And then then what I'm going to do is put them at the historical society. So I, I don't think there'll be a second book, but there will be an addendum so that people can come see, you know, as an example, I got a couple laying here on my desk right here. Let's see if I pull, pull a good one out. But I mean, this is kind of, but this is a photo in the Greensburg oh, wow. yards in the, in the 1960s. And a guy sent me two or three of these photos. And I, so I've digitized them and, and they'll be on the record at the historical society for people to access someday. Yeah, I just, it's amazing. You know, you've definitely sparked a lot of people's interest locally, I'm sure, you know, with the book coming out, got them thinking, you know, about things and looking through their stuff and saying, oh, I, I have a bit of history here that I can share. Well, and 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 that is the fun part. And, and you know, I, I, I told people I name dropped a lot in the book. And by name dropped, I, you know, I have charts of the, the, the list, the station masters saying, 1916. And, you know, in a county like ours, somebody looks at that and goes, oh, my gosh, that that's great grandpa on mom's side. That's that's who that was. You know, yeah, he, he worked for the railroad. And it's just I've had people come up to me and say, oh, oh Larry, we we knew the guy that was we we're related to the station master at Bernie. We we we, we figured out who that was, you know, and that's been just priceless, just priceless. To do, you know, the name didn't mean anything to me, but it meant something to somebody else, you know, and and that's a fun thing. That's for sure. I mean, I'm just amazed by the history. Um, there's, um, there's a restaurant I frequent in in uh, Massachusetts. It's the uh, Steaming Tender Restaurant, and she has um, historical photos throughout the restaurant. Some are in the restroom. You know, so when you go in there, you know, you can see all these historical photos. Um, and, you know, she told a story. The owner said that one of the customers came up to her and said, 
in the bathroom. That's one of my relatives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the historical photo in there. And it's just yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's just, it's what makes it. And, you know, I like I said, I did that intentionally when I was writing the book. I, I'd run across these names. And I'd think, well, you know, I'll just mention, I'll mention this guy's name. You know, I, I don't know him, but somebody might know him. And and uh, sure enough, you know, people read it and go, yeah, that's uh, that's old uncle, great uncle Fred, you know, or what. You, you know, one, one thing that happened to me, like I said, Gail and I moved here in 1979. And, of course, at that point, the, the rail was pretty well shut down in the county. But, you know local newspaper. I'd, we're new to the community. So, you know, you read every page of the newspaper to try to learn about what the community is like. And, and I'd read obituaries. And again, this is 1979. The guy's 80 years old, died. And it would say, uh, you know, he worked for the New York Central from 1922 to, and it's like, and, and you'd see a lot of these and, it, and you know, it was like, dang, a lot of people around here work for the railroad. That was kind of my thought, you know? And then I'd think, God, there's no railroad really here now. How, how did that work? Well, now I know. Now I know. A lot of people work for the railroad, you know. Yeah, it's just, that's amazing. And they built it and, and they built a community around it. I just really wish, you know, with my research of it, you know, like with the historical buildings that are here today, yeah. I just wish, you know, a lot of, um, you know, railroads or communities would preserve it. Yeah. And I see a lot of I've seen some cases where a community was able to move a structure because mm -hmm. the railroad doesn't want the structure on their property anymore. They're able to preserve it. And then I've seen some cases where nobody's stepped up and it ends up taking the wrecking ball. Yep. So I tell the sad story, actually, in the foreword of the book of the Greensburg Depot. The, the last Greensburg had three depots over time. So when Abraham Lincoln went through here on his inaugural train in 1861, that, that there's no photos or, or any record of that depot. The second depot was built in 1865. And then the third depot was built in 1909. In the book, there are gorgeous photos of that, that building. It was just wonderful. And Conrail tore it down in 1987. And it's so sad because it would have made a great restaurant. It would have, it, it's just, it was the coolest structure. There's great, great pictures of it in the book. And, uh, you know, today, today, I think it wouldn't have gotten torn down if it was, I think people have a better feel for that kind of thing. But at that time it was like, nah, just tear it down, you know, just tear it down. so sad because it, because it was a gorgeous brick. Like I said, it was built in 1909. It was beautiful, just beautiful. And, uh, so, but we did, uh, save at least two of the, I call them the headstones. That's probably not the right word, but up in the top of the building, it said Greensburg. There were actually five of those on this building sprinkled around the building. And, uh, somebody hung on to at least two of those. They salvaged those. And it's very cool that we've still got those. We got some great pictures in the, the book of those. And they say Greensburg and, uh, really, really fun. In fact, yeah, this doesn't, I don't know if I can show it very well here. Uh, but anyhow, and I kidded the guy that, uh, that I found out he had it in his backyard. And, uh, he, he, he said to me, he said, what are you going to tell people about this, Larry? And I said, I'll tell them whatever you want me to tell. I said, but I'm glad you stole it. I said, I said, no, nobody knew who, nobody had any idea who it was. And I said, I'm just glad you stole it. And so he felt a lot better about that. And he, he, he told me, so this, I know this won't show real well, but you know, if you, if you look at, so there's the, you, you can see the, the Greensburg. So there were five of these up at the top uh, of the, of the depot. I am so happy. You're right. I'm so happy that he was able to snag that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's like a treasure there, you know, it's the part of the building that, you know, that's salvaged essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So, so pretty fun. And again, just fun finding those kind of things and learning about them. And, and, uh, and we just hope more information will come forward. That's for sure. Well, once again, uh, tell us where you can find your book. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so if you get online, the D Decatur County, I think they actually call it the historical Society of Decatur County, Indiana. 
uh, you can you can uh, call them and order one there. You you my email is uh, Larry Roof R U E F F uh, at Swine Vet Services Swine Vet Services dot com all one word Larry Roof at Swine Vet Services dot com. If you drop me an email, we'll send you one. Uh, <clears throat> it's uh, it's been fun. Uh, not you know. I tell people again, all the proceeds are $75 a piece. All the proceeds go to the historical society. It's so important for us to help our historical societies preserve all this information about everything, not just the railroads, but I've had, it's been so much fun to have uh, people that have moved away from our County uh, have gotten a hold of a book and called me or emailed me and said, Oh, what great memories of when we lived there. And, uh, so they make great gifts for for people like that, and uh, uh, so so yeah, we'd really be excited if, if people are interested. Yeah, I mean it's just so awesome to be able to capture this stuff. I mean, the, a lot of these books, you know, for for a particular area, are hard to come by. Yeah, you know, I'm yeah. always you know you're always searching for you know uh, the history books locally. You can find like a book that's covering a huge area, right? When you <clears> right. Really get into the actual local history that's that's something yeah and it's a you know it's a hard it's a hard back cover glossy pages i mean it's a really nice book you know it makes a great coffee table for the people that still have coffee tables in their their <laughs> that know what that is but you know it makes a great book again lots of photos uh, the the best compliment i've gotten i've gotten lots of good compliments but and i appreciate all those but a friend of mine uh, I actually let him start reading it before we got the published stuff back and his wife walked in and she said, Did, are, are you asleep? And he goes, no. He said, I read a couple of pages. I look at a couple of pictures and then I just have to think a little bit. And I just said, that was the best compliment, you know, that you just couldn't speed read, you know, he had to just kind of look at it and think a little bit about what I just told him, you know? And so that was really fun. Oh, amazing. So definitely, you know, I would certainly recommend to all of our viewers, certainly pick up one of, one of uh, uh, Larry's books. Um, just a phenomenal, like not even if you're not even from the area, just being able to see that history. Yeah. I, I, again, I think what's fun, Jonathan, is even though it's a history to Cater County, the first couple of chapters really help people understand what the heck was going on prior to the Civil War around the startup of, of technology. You know, I, I tell about how, you know, people that don't know in Indiana, but, you know, the, the, the challenge, they, they thought they needed to build canals rather than trains. Train technology was so new. And I actually read the report from 1835 that the state legislature committee trying to decide what they were going to put their money towards. And they concluded that canals were a much better thing than this thing called a railroad. And of course they were wrong as can be, but, yeah. but, but you know, that's Monday morning quarterbacking, you know? Yeah. And uh, so, so, you know, it's just interesting to, to, when you read those first couple of chapters and go, wow, here's what was going on. Here's what people were thinking. You had visionaries, you had people that weren't sure. You had people that thought this technology would be better yeah, just an amazing time. Amazing time. I just really appreciate you being able to take the time to to share some of this from the book with us. We really do appreciate it. I Thanks truly, I truly love rail fanning, and I truly love the history. I mean, the history is phenomenal. You know, the things that used to be, maybe mm -hmm. still there, the remnants of what was left, is certainly amazing. Well, you know, the welcome mat's always open, so come on up, and we'll drive around the county a little bit and probably end up at the St. Paul Tavern for a little bit, and we'll just have a great time. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Any other questions? That's, I, I'm just, you covered so much within the period of time that we've sat down, and I love uh, the slides to be able to help you tell that story. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me on.